Okay, here we go. Boom, ding, 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 and a one, a two, a one, two. Welcome to Beyond the Expected Podcast. I'm Alan Inkles, director of the Stalos Center for the Arts at Stony Brook University, and your guest host of this very special episode with the incomparable Alan Alda. Alan Alda is a legendary actor, director, writer, author, and for more than 11 years, the host of Scientific American Frontiers on PBS. In 2010, he founded the Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University, where he is a visiting professor. More recently, through his Alda Communication Training Program, he launched Clear and Vivid with Alan Alda, a podcast which looks to help listeners connect better with others in every area of their lives. Alan, thank you for joining us on Beyond the Expected. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to going beyond here. In, in your podcast, Alan, and in your uh, communicating science, you talk a lot about empathy and the importance of listening. Uh, how do these two traits impact our ability to communicate? I, I think listening that, that's born of empathy is essential. I don't think you can communicate without it. The, the really good communicators do it as a matter of course, and they probably don't even think that they're employing empathy. But it, it, a, lot of it, a lot of understanding what I'm trying to say about empathy depends on how you define empathy. That's a funny word because there must be a different definition for it for everybody who uses it. And what I mean with regard to empathy, when you're talking about communication, is being aware of what's going on in the head and the heart of the other person. Uh, there, there, there are people who I think make a make one thing out of empathy and compassion, and it, and in my mind they're not wedded together. I I go along with the people who make a distinction between empathy and compassion because empathy gives you a chance to understand, to feel with, in a way, what the other person is feeling. That doesn't mean you necessarily wish them well or, or that you want to uh, do them good or that you have compassion for them. Because, for, for instance, bullies use empathy because they know exactly what you're going through and they know how to hurt you interrogators know how to use empathy and they don't always have your best interests in mind. Probably most interrogators don't, but they know they have to be able to read you and know what's the most effective way to break you, to get you to spill the beans. So that, I think those are two good examples. Uh, politicians are uh, another iffy example. Sometimes when they say, I feel your pain, they actually mean right. it. And sometimes, <laughs> maybe maybe more often than not, it's a, it's a way of trying to get you to believe that they pay attention to you. Uh, not to run down politicians. The, the, the Greeks thought the polit politics was a noble effort. And uh, when it's done well, I agree. Your success with the uh, scientific uh, communication, teaching uh, scientists to communicate, has been so successful. Uh, and we're so fortunate at Stony Brook to be part of this ride you've been going on. Um, tell us about the journey. Um, when you talk to scientists about teaching science to non-scientists, um, how do you benchmark the success with that program, Alan? Well, partly it's through the experience of the people we work with the people we train uh, we they report back to us very interesting results after the training very very surprising results you know we've trained over 15,000 people uh, in eight different countries in the past 10 years and so I expected that this training would enable scientists to communicate with the public better. And we hear that over and over. We see people winning awards in communication, people we've trained who up until that point had not won awards for communicating science. Some of the surprising things we hear are that it helps speak to other scientists better. Because when you think about it, so the world is so siloized now. 
in, in science because everybody's a specialist in a field that's taken them 20 or 30 years to explore. And not only are the public, not only is the public at large not able to have that same expertise, but other scientists don't have that deep understanding of the silo that the, uh, that one specialist has found himself in. So to communicate across disciplines requires almost the same kind of clarity and vividness that it takes to talk to, to an educated lay person. Is there, a, is there a trick to it? I mean, not to use a magician word, but to change the way people talk, the way scientists talk to non-scientists? Is there some sort of one-size-fits-all, or is there a bunch of different things you, you teach to them to, to get that point across? You know, I, I cringe at the thought of tips because a tip is an intellectualization of the process of, of what you need to learn to do. If, if I were going to play the piano at Carnegie Hall next Friday and I had never taken a lesson before, it wouldn't really do me much good if you were to say, here's three things to remember when you go on stage, right? Right. I'm, I'm, I, it's a process. It's, 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 learning. It's, it's learning to transform yourself. There is an overriding thing, what we were just talking about, which is to be aware of what the other person is going through while you're talking to them. And this matters whether you're talking to an audience live or writing for them. Now you think, well, how can you know what's going on in the mind of the reader who's not there in either time or space? You can, you can have a good estimate of what's going on because you can say, when I lay down this first sentence, what is that doing to this other person's brain? What, are they, what direction am I sending them? So what's the next sentence I should put down to follow up on that? And how do I structure that sentence? That's um, how do I pick up on where they are and lead them to the next place? Are you surprised when, or are the scientists surprised when they find out that their communicating is not really being communicative? They're surprised by that. And I'll tell you the other thing that surprises them and me. We really, really were surprised this more than one scientist has said doing this training and learning how to step back from my work and not be mired in the details when I talk about it but to try to talk first of all from the point of view of the big picture to see to see it as a whole and capture the attention of who I'm talking to first with that before I get into the details which are like sagebrush and <laughs> trap you in, in place. <laughs> when they do that, they tell us they understand their own work better. Now, isn't that interesting that it helps the scientist do his own work to learn to communicate about it better? That's, that was a real surprise to me. And it just shows that they're, they're the advantage of thinking about how it's going to land on another person is so valuable because it changes the way you think about your work. And as a result of that, the way you formulate the message is not how you would say it best to satisfy yourself, but how you would say it to get into the head of the other person and make sure it sticks. And it'll stick if it's got some emotion in it, it's got story. If it's if it engages them right off the bat and continues to engage them, do they see this whole focus on the other person is a is an, is a different way of looking at communication because most of us think of communication as saying something that we understand in a really um, brief way but that's all the all the attention there is on what we have to say but if we combine that with the intention of with the intention of making it clear to the person we're talking to and vivid to them and engaging them and keeping them in mind the whole time we're talking it changes the message it changes the shape of the message the content the meaning of it is still the same 
but it comes out it comes out like a different song. You know, you're so passionate about this, and we jumped right into it at the beginning, but before we went on the air, we talked about how this sort of began and how you sort of tried to sell this to universities, and Stony Brook bid on it, thankfully, for all of us. What, what sort of drove you to do this, and um, how have you felt about this relationship you've had with Stony Brook for about 11 years now? I'm so lucky that uh, Shirley Kenny, well, she, what's her middle name? Shirley Strum. Kenny Shirley was her Strum, maiden name. Shirley, maiden Strum, name, Shirley Kenny. Strum Kenny. I'm so lucky that I was sitting next to her at dinner that time about 12 years ago when I was, you invited you me. You did a performance at our theater. Yeah. And uh, we had dinner a, a little bit after that performance. And I turned to her the way I did to every uh, university president that I met during that time and said, what do you think? Couldn't we teach scientists while we're training them to be good scientists? Couldn't we train them at the same time to be good communicators? Mainly because if the public doesn't understand science, they're not going to get behind the efforts to, to do more science. They're also not going to be able to understand what, whether they should be worried about the science. They need, they need real information to know things like vaccinations are good for society and, and why they shouldn't worry about what they seem to be worried about now about vaccinations. They need, they need to be communicated with, but they need to be made communication partners, not to think of them as bottles that need to be filled up with some information because that's just going to spill across them. They're not going to retain it. These wonderful scientists are at their age where they are now. Where does it need to begin? What, can, what tools can we give to educators for K through 12 or beyond early college to help them learn about this early on before they become the scientists that you're now sort of trying to reinvent or rebuild their, their, uh, their vocabulary? Well, I, you know, my hope for what we're doing at the all the Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook. My hope is that it will grow as it's, as it's been growing for the past 10 years. We started out with scientists and then we branched into helping he health professionals, physicians, nurses, uh, people in the administration of hospitals and that kind of thing, helping them communicate better as well. And the training is only slightly different. It's only translated into the language and the, the practices of, of, the, of, of a slightly different uh, group of people. But it also will work for ec economists. It'll work for people in business. And it'll work and be very useful in schools eventually, um, middle schools. One of the, when we talked about bullying before, if people are trained and enjoy the notion of looking into the heart of the other person, it's going to be a little bit harder to be a bully or to, to let bully be, bullying be sustained by people around you. Other people are more likely to come to the aid of the bullied kid if they say, look what you're doing to that kid, don't do that. So I, it, it really applies to every aspect of our lives which is the basis of the podcast I do, Clear and Vivid. And the term Clear and Vivid really grew out of our work with scientists, make your, make your talk clear and vivid. It turns out that you have to be clear and vivid when you're trying to figure out with your spouse where you're going to take a vacation or you're talking to your child about drugs. You've got to engage them at their level, wherever they are in their lives. And I, I, I understood this from my own experience as an actor. That's the surprising thing about this. I did, it didn't just occur to me out of the blue. From the time I was um, an actor as a kid, as a young man, I realized in a growing way, and it, didn't, I didn't, it didn't happen to me all at once, I realized the importance of relating to the other actor. The interesting thing is you don't, you don't say your lines because they're written in the script. 
if you're really acting well. You, you say your next line because the other actor has done something or said something that makes you say it and makes you say it a certain way. And if you're receptive to that, if you're sensitive to what's coming at you and you respond to that and not to the need to say what's written in the script, then it comes alive and there's an exchange between the two people Presumably the ball is then tossed back to the other person in the same way, and the other person responds in this, similarly. And it's just like what every musician I've had on the podcast, Yo-Yo Ma, Itzhak Perlman, Renee Fleming, they've all said the same thing about playing, making music with other musicians. You toss the ball back and forth, and that makes it a little different every night. Every performance is different from every other performance. Even though the notes are the same, the music is the same. You don't play a different tune, but you play it differently. And it, that makes it an alive thing, and it makes it interesting to watch. So that's what happened when I did the science show. I took the experience I had as an actor and, and, and my, my training as an improviser which was the only training I ever had as an actor was to learn to improvise. And it was for me, I think the most important thing I could have done. I took that and used it on the science show and made real contact with the scientists. And if I didn't understand what they were saying, I would grab them by the shirt and tell them I didn't one guy I grabbed by the cheeks. I said, I don't get it. Tell me again, tell me another way. I don't know what you're saying. And then they dropped worrying about making a lecture for the, for, the, for the entertainment, the interest of the people on the other side of the camera. They were concerned with me personally. And then it became a human interaction. And I realized that it would probably be possible to train scientists to do that without somebody like me standing next to them, helping draw it out of them they could learn to make that same contact direct person to person with the audience. And again, not just with the audience listening in the room, but even writing for them, talking to a, an interviewer on, on, uh, on camera about it, but be aware of the other person. And that's what's happened. And, and, and then I realized when we were, when we were do, I wrote this book called, if I understood you, would I have this look <laughs> on my face? Great which book. kind of the title kind of encapsulates the idea, and when when I when someone suggested that we could help raise funds for the Center for Communicating Science, if I did a podcast and sold ads on it, uh, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to interview people from all different walks of life? and see how these rules apply when they have to communicate well. And most of the people I talk to are expert communicators. But from so many different areas, musicians, comedians, actors, directors, uh, people in... Um, world, people, lead, world leaders. World you've leaders. Had on, um, journalists. If you've, not, if you've not listened to the clear and vivid podcasts, you need to get on them right away. Uh, Alan has done six seasons in two years, which sort of means you probably finish a season and five minutes later start the next season. Almost, yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't take much time off. They're, they're amazing. They're, they're just they're, great. The seventh season coming up is so, it's just, it's, it's our best one in terms of the interesting people and the fun conversations we have and insightful conversations. And the, starting off with Tom Hanks and... Uh, Paul McCartney. Sir Paul, Mc, Paul McCartney. Right? Yeah, well, I, I, take, <laughs> I take the liberty of calling him Paul. He's your buddy now. That's it. Yeah, well, you know, when you meet him, and you know you're meeting somebody who is one of the most famous people in the world. He had to come to our studio through the freight, the freight elevator because he's so famous. He, can't, can't, he still can't walk through the regular parts of the city without being stopped. And... Yet, when he walks in the room, he's, he's an everyday guy. And we, we established a rapport right away within the first few minutes. And somebody had left a piano and two guitars in the studio. And when I came in earlier, I said, what, 
what's that? What are those instruments? And they said, well, you never know. I said, no, we can't do that. We can't make it look like we want him to play, <laughs> to play instruments for us. That's, that's not fair. And he came in a minute later, and I could see his face fell a little bit. And he, he, was, he felt that somebody was setting him up to perform. You know? And I tried to let him know that it was an, an, I, I didn't know anything about it. it wasn't, I didn't intend anything like that. But we had such good connection during the first few minutes that when I asked him how he comes up with a melody, I was really curious. I, I said, do you, do you noodle on an instrument? Do you hum it? Do you whistle it? How, do you, how does it come to you? He started to tell me, he said, no, I noodle. And then he said, look, there's a piano over there. Let me show you what I mean. He was so generous. You know, I mean, he went from thinking, what are they they're trying to set me up for, to, to saying, let me show you how I do it. And he went over to the piano, and it was, they left an out-of-tune piano there. <laughs> it was, <laughs> he was kind enough not to mention, this, this damn thing is out of tune, you know. But he started noodling and showing me step by step how he comes up with the melody and the words, the words out of, a ki- out of kind of nonsense syllables that he turns into the words of the song. It was, it was, fa- I don't, I, I've listened to a lot of his interviews. I don't, I don't think I've seen him do that any place else. It's a, if you listen to that, you'll hear something that I don't, I don't know if he's ever done before. And I know you've got Tom Hanks on, and you, the gentleman who gave you your Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah. Uh, listening to the two of you, this uh, Alan has a seven-season promo uh, podcast, which, as we talked about before, is a season in itself. It is just so terrific. I know we have so almost everybody from the seven seasons in little clips, and 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 we the production team and I talk about it, and we talk about our reactions to the people, and and it actually is. I'm so interested to hear what what's on their minds. Because there we are on on the microphone, and we're discussing it for the first time. We haven't planned what we're going to say, and it's, it was very interesting to me to hear everybody's different reactions. Betty White is uh, is Betty on the seventh season, is right? The seventh season. She's so adorable, and she's so funny. She's developed this character that's super sweet, with this spicy edge to it. In fact, she and she's always looking for the punchline. You know, she's 98, and, she, <laughs> and she's never stopped looking for the punchline. She, I said, you have this character that's so sweet, and you're, you're spicy saucy. She says, I'm not spicy. That's a lot of crap. <laughs> so that coming out of a 98-year-old refined lady is... She's she knows. Funny. She knows how funny it's going to be. But listening to, to Alan and Tom, if you're a young actor out there, this is listening to two of the most amazing performers in our history oh, uh, together. Well, well it's, uh, it uh, goes without he saying. He really is extraordinary. And what I found so interesting about him was he talks about, he's fascinated with typewriters. He has a collection of over 100 typewriters. That's already kind of interesting. But he can talk almost like a poet about what it's like to hit the key and when the the, the part of the machinery with the letter on it hits the paper, what it does to the paper. It doesn't just lay ink on top of the paper, he says. It puts it into the very fiber of the paper. And he talks about it like creating a work of art in the process of typing. It, it's, it's very, you got to hear him say it. It's very interesting. He thinks deeply about things. He's, he doesn't take things for granted. And I think that must be in some way, part of what makes him such a good actor. He doesn't, doesn't glide over the surface, but he doesn't make a big deal about it either. He's not busy showing you, look how good I am at being an actor. And that's, that's a great trick. That's what Spencer Tracy used to say. Don't ever let them catch you acting. And that's the seventh season, which begins in just a couple of days. We're, yeah. the, we're launch, you're launching the season, so don't miss the Clear and Vivid with Alan Alda series, which opens up in a couple of days, just before before uh, we go into the next episode. You know what I wonder is how many people know how to find a podcast? Well, let's tell them. You, the, <laughs> if you have an iPhone, there's a little icon in there that gets your podcast. But the easiest way to do it, if you've never done it before, is go to alanalda.com. And the page that opens up on the left-hand side, it'll say clear and vivid. 
and it'll have a picture of me smiling at you longingly, wanting you to listen. You won't be disappointed. And and the, if the preview is anything like the season's going to be, it's going to be amazing. And now I'm going to ask you an unfair question. Uh -huh. um, you've done now seven seasons. Uh, you've had people from all walks of life, as you said, great performers, journalists, world leaders, scientists, doctors. Madeline Albright. Madeline Albright. Um, do you have a favorite one? No, I don't. <laughs> and I'll tell you something weird about it that, that, that came out in the, the preview show we were just talking about. These conversations are so spontaneous, and I'm listening so intently to what the other person is saying that when it's over, I don't remember what we said. I don't really. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think you say that in the seventh episode. Yeah, I think your your team is telling you what 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 you, you know, what you what, what, what did you we did. say next. You know, but so once in a while, I I remember something because it's so interesting, and I'm I'm pretty sure that I remember this right. The the person we had on who was a, uh, a head negotiator for the FBI for hostage release said that the way he learned to no negotiate for the release of a hostage was very useful in a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the that. kind of sticks in my head. Uh, great, great interviews. And uh, I, I have one more question left for you. Uh -huh. uh, I remember in an interview reading that as an 11 year old, you went up to a science teacher and, and asked the teacher to explain what a flame is. So this is sort of our it's our version of Stony Brook's version of our Pearly Gates question for you. Not quite as severe as, as Lipton would give you, but what would Alan Alda today say to that fifth grade Alan Alda whose teacher couldn't adequately answer the question about a flame? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think what I'd say is, boy, what a good question that is. <laughs> Let's try to figure that out. Where can we find that, the answer to that out? Let's see if we can think about it. Think of some good questions about it. Why is it hot? Why is it, why is it different colors? Why, why, how come you can put your finger through it if you do it fast enough? What, what's going on in there? Let's see if we can find out. It's a lot easier to do that now on Google. When I asked my teacher, she wasn't specifically a science teacher. She was a, a, an all-purpose teacher. But... She thought for a minute, and all she could come up with when I said, what's, what's in the flame? She, she, she said, oxidation. <laughs> now, then I had two yeah. things I didn't understand. So that, that's a, it was an, I was 11 years old, and it was an early example that if you, if you answer a probing question with a brick wall, like a technical jargony term, you're liable to cut off curiosity. But if you assist with the curiosity, if you get on the curiosity bandwagon together, wow, that's interesting. Let's see if we can figure that out. Especially in her case, because she had trouble figuring out what it was. She knew there was some technical term for it, but she was satisfied to leave it at that. Whereas we can learn, you know, people, Teachers are always saying, I learn from my students. You can certainly learn along with your students because they might, be, they might have questions that are interesting enough to give you a different angle in on the subject and give you a view of it that you might not have had before. So the idea that you can encourage curiosity by being curious yourself and joining with another person on that exciting road to discovery I think is probably a good way to live, let alone a good way to teach. I think Stony Brook may owe that teacher a lot of gratitude because we are so fortunate that you've brought this science world to Stony Brook. It was so great to have you here. Uh, you've added another portion to your life that has made you such an impeccable actor, director, writer, uh, and scientist now, we're going no, to I'm say. No, I'm not a scientist. But, well, All you, I, 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 I'm not even a journalist. I, I respect journalists so much because they take on the responsibility of understanding what the scientist is saying, which is often very difficult to do because the work is so complicated. And then they take on the responsibility of explaining it, sort of digesting it themselves and explaining it. And I, and I, don't, I don't do that. I just, I ask the, 
I get it from the horse's mouth. I ask the horse the questions out of real curiosity and, and, let, and try to get them to tell us in their heartfelt way. But I'm, you, 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 you must know that I'm, I'm so grateful to be here working at Stony Brook University because Laura Lindenfeld, who's the director of the Center for Communicating Science, and her whole team, Sarah Chase, who helps me run the old Center for Communicating Science, that contributes a lot of funding to the Center for Communicating Science here at uh, Stony Brook. These people are extraordinary. They're, they're, it's as though they're in a movement. They're, they, they work overtime. You almost have to tell them, don't work so hard because you're going to run out of steam because they see the effect they're having on the people who take the training. And they get, at the end, of, I remember we, we did a, in Chicago a few years ago, we did a, a training session for some of the most prominent senior scientists in the country. And they gave us a standing ovation when it was over. And they get this, our trainers go out, do workshops around the world maybe 125 times a year. It's not all done at Stony Brook. We teach at Stony Brook too, but most of what we do is, okay, we've been in every state in the union in seven or eight other countries. And we get that reaction everywhere we go. They, they've worked out a curriculum that is so powerful and goes step by step from the earliest introductory exercises to much more complicated connecting with the other person. It, it, it's not a formula, but it's really good pedagogy. The people in the program you talk about talk about your passion. And it's the passion that you have that makes it so successful. We're honored to have you at Stony Brook. And this was such an honor and pleasure to interview for Beyond the Expected. Alan Alder, you are a genius in every way. It's a pleasure oh, to have you here. You can take that last part out. Not coming out. We're keeping <laughs> that. That's it. There's some other things they might want to take out that I did, but let's keep that one in because you absolutely are. Thank you so much, Alan. Really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank you.